Good evening, everyone. Um, I am coming to you from Pittsburgh. My name is Dawn Plummer. I'm from the Pittsburgh Food Policy Council, and I'm so excited to be with you and be together with our panelists tonight. Uh, this is a really exciting opportunity uh, to have a deep and uh, impactful conversation around questions of hunger and food uh, security. Um, tonight, we're kicking off uh, a survival summit series being uh, hosted by the Cairo Center. Um, and this is a series of conversations uh, that will look at issues that our society has been facing um, during this time of COVID of the COVID-19 global pandemic and how we've managed to survive despite the inadequate response that we've seen from a policy point of view. Um, there's still so much need out there uh, that is not being met despite the things that have happened over the last period of time um, and the things and actions that have been taken by our federal, state and local governments. Uh, tonight's conversation, as I mentioned, is going to be focused on hunger and food justice. And we have with us a fantastic group of leaders, scholars, uh, organizers, um, and just some great folks to uh, to think together with. And we also will invite your participation as well um, as we as the night unfolds. Tonight we'll be joined by the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris uh, from the Cairo Center and the um, the National Poor People's uh, Campaign. We have Raj Patel, uh, Allison Cohen, Keith Bullard. Lou Aya and Maureen Taylor, and I will give a, a, a larger uh, introduction to, to each of our guests tonight um, as we go along. I want to make sure that uh, we're clear tonight is the conversation will be about how we make sure that everyone has enough food to eat. Uh, you know, we're, we're human beings, we need that nourishment, we need that fuel, um, and we know that our society does not actually make that the, the, the reality that we can all access food in the way that we need and the kind of food that we need to sustain ourselves and our communities. Um, and so we're looking really forward to the conversation. Um, and also we're inviting participants to uh, work with us uh, and share your thoughts and questions with our presenters uh, through both Facebook and YouTube, or you can tweet us at, at the Cairo Center uh, using the hashtag, hashtag survival summit. And before we get started, I want to welcome Lou Aya, who's going to be opening up uh, the session tonight with a song. Thank you, Dom. Peace and blessings, family. I just want to begin with gratitude. Gratitude for each of your lives who are joining us tonight. Uh, gratitude for the ability uh, to be here advocating for, singing for, working for, organizing uh, for human rights, for this celebration of life. And I do want to begin by acknowledging with this song that our people are in pain, that there is an active struggle right now in the places that we find ourselves, in our families, our communities, uh, all across this land. And so tonight we're going to start with a song. It's called From Now On. And it says the words, we are hurting, but in this pain, we're learning how to love our people from now on. And this song hopefully grounds us in that effort to love each other, to care for each other in a good way. It goes like this, wherever you are, you're gonna learn it quick. And I'd love you to sing it out into the room that you're in. Join our vibrations with this optimistic promise. Here we go. We are hurting, but in this pain we're learning how to love our people from now on. So that one more time. We are hurting, but in this pain we're learning how to love our people from now on. Now we're going to say this. We are growing, and finally we are flowing, wild like a river from now on. Let's do that together. We are growing. We are growing, and finally we are flowing, wild like a river from now on. Let's do it all together like a promise. We are 
But in this pain we're learning How to love our people From now on We are growing And we are growing Finally we are flowing While like a river From now on Alright y'all My freedom is breathing the air of the trees And I'm speaking a piece of my mind Every day that I work, I'm protecting the earth and my daughter will need to survive. So tell the boss he's taking a loss, the system is ready to die. Cause we're breaking the law and we're breaking it hard and we're breaking this poverty line. We've seen the face and we've seen the face and we've seen the face of our God. We hungry, broken, angry and we taking back our job. We bound to crush this system up between the workers' teeth. Cause our job is breaking border walls and our job is getting free. Cause right now... We are hurting, but in this pain we're learning How to love our people from now on Say we are growing, we are growing Finally we are flowing Wild like a river from now on We gonna sing it one more time And this last time I really wanna sing it like a promise like this time together is really about learning how to love each other. That's not a small thing. I believe that we can do that. We're gonna need our faith in this time. We're gonna need our trust in each other. So since we're gonna spend some time together tonight, let's join on this vibration, this commitment to learn how to love each other from now on. One more time. We are hurting, but in this pain we're learning how to love our people. From now on We are growing And we are growing And finally we are flowing Wild like a river From now on From now on Oh, I had such beautiful words to say, and now they were muted. Um, sorry about that, y'all. I was thanking Lou for sharing his um, talents with us and for helping us um, join together in song. I know I was singing here alone in my room, but knowing that each of you were also um, joining me and uh, and just appreciate the opportunity to open our hearts to the conversation and our minds and, and the ideas and uh, plans that we can come up with together uh, this evening. Uh, and so without any further ado, I would like to welcome the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, um, director of the Cairo Center and the national co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. Thanks so much, Dawn, and thanks, Lou, um, uh, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in this evening. Uh, the Cairo Center um, for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice, our mission is to raise up generations of religious and community leaders who are dedicated to building a social movement, a broad, uh, united movement to address the interlocking injustices of systemic racism and poverty ecological devastation, the war economy, and this false moral narrative, this narrative that blames poor people, hungry people for all of society's problems, that pits us against each other and feeds us this lie, this lie that this is as good as it gets, uh, this lie of scarcity, when in fact we're actually living in a world of beautiful, um, amazing abundance. And so uh, we have uh, come together for this online program and grassroots leaders from all across the country gathered today uh, to engage in sharing of experiences and brainstorming what it's going to take for us to build this movement 
led by those that are most impacted in order to actually change the, the priorities of our society and, and make sure that everybody uh, gets the justice that is possible and that we all deserve. And so um, it's, it's an honor to be here with you all this evening um, because what we know is that to build a movement of millions it takes small conversations and larger conversations led by those that are, are on the forefront of grassroots organizing um, and, and coming up with the kinds of solutions that we all need uh, to, to solve this great injustice. The fact that there are 140 million people in the richest country in human history who are poor or one emergency, one job loss, one healthcare crisis, uh, one, one storm. Um, from economic ruin. The fact that we throw out more food than it takes to feed every person in this uh, that is hungry, not just in this country, but in this world. And yet we have folks, 51% of our kids going to bed at night in food insecure homes. Well, we know that the solutions to these issues come from building a movement and from grassroots leaders like who are joining us this evening. And so it's a great honor, a great privilege to be here in the mix. And, and thank you for tuning in. I look forward to the, the continued conversation. Thanks so much, Reverend Liz, for your comments. Um, let's, we're gonna, as we go along this evening, we're gonna invite um, others to join us in the conversation. And first I'd like to transition to our panelists, uh, Raj Patel, uh, who is gonna help us frame our conversation uh, for the evening. And for those of you who may not know Raj, he is an award-winning author, filmmaker, and academic. He's a research professor at the University of Texas at Austin um, and a public intellectual and wonderful person all the way around. So thank you so much for joining us, Raj. Um, I would love to have you share some words with us. Um, thank you, Dawn. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm very excited to, to, to be here and I'm, I'm ready to engage with uh, some of the, the, the sort of big uh, questions that, that you've asked us to, to, to think about today. I mean, w w one of them is, uh, look, why is it that we live in a country that produces so much food, as Reverend Liz just pointed out, and yet we have so much hunger. How is it that we can uh, not only have so much hunger, but have so many diseases associated with bad diets? Uh, how is it that we can be hungry and suffering metabolic syndrome and uh, type two diabetes at the same time? And how can there be all of this uh, you know, abundance and scarcity happening at the same time? Um, so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm gonna just jump in and talk about that uh, if, if that's all right, Dawn. I mean- uh, Please, uh, that sounds fantastic. So, in, I mean, it, it, look, there's there's a simple reason for that, and uh, you know, l l let me just sort of introduce myself properly. You know, Raj Patel, he him pronouns. Uh, here I am on the stolen land uh, in Austin, Texas. Uh, Texas, of course, the only state uh, that fought for slavery twice. Uh, now, I, I you know, I, I say all that uh, not to just be sort of performatively woke, um, but as a way of reminding us that this is a country that was built on a food system that involves stolen land and stolen labor and stolen people. Um, that uh, you know, the United States of America couldn't be the United States of America were it not for the vast theft of land from the people who were here first, and then the application of labor from people who were uh, trafficked across the Atlantic uh, and whose descendants remain uh, in, in, I mean, in mo modern terms, uh, still uh, it, it substantially unfree. Now, the, the, uh, the, the story of uh, agricultural labor in America is a story really about stealing. It's about stealing work. It's about stealing the bounty of nature. It's about stealing land. Um, but it also means that the food system we have today operates along the lines that you need for that kind of institutionalized theft. Uh, it operates on the boundaries of private property. So the reason that it's possible for us to have more food per person than any time in human history around the world, and we have uh, more than 2 billion people uh, across the planet who are food insecure, is because of the way that we distribute food. And the way we distribute food is on the, the basis of the ability to pay. And so, you know, if, if you have money, you can eat whatever you like. Uh, and if you don't have enough money, then you uh, either you starve or you eat a diet that is not good for you. I mean, globally, a healthy diet costs about four dollars per person per day. And obviously, in, in different contexts, that costs different. You know, it, it's a different amount. Uh, but that cost of eating healthily is beyond 
3 billion people on this planet. Out of 8 billion, 3 billion can't afford to eat healthily. And again, that's not uh, because there's not enough healthy food. It's because the way we distribute food is through the market and it's through capitalism. And capitalism is expressly designed uh, to screw the people at the bottom of the food system out of money. Uh, it, again, it's not an accident that in this country uh, that, you know, that, that has its agricultural history of, of, of lay, labor theft, seven of the worst paying jobs in America today are in the food system. And it's also not an accident uh, that, you know, the, 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 this is segregated by race. I mean, the, the whitest job in America, according to the Bureau of Labor, uh, is the assessment and valuation of things. And the second whitest thing uh, to be doing in, in the United States is to own or operate a farm. Uh, that racial segregation is not an accident. That's the product of this country's history. And if we are to end hunger, then we need to address that racial history. And we also need to address the fact that the people going hungry are the people whose hands touch our food. Uh, again, not an accident, but that's that's by design. Uh, and so maybe that's a good place to start our conversation, Dawn. That sounds great. Thank you so much for kicking us off. Um, these are not uh, light topics, so we're jumping right into it. Um, I, I have a, a one question for you, which is, um, you know, amidst all of this abundance, why would you say there's so much scarcity then? Well, that's it. I mean, it, it, it's the, the myth of scarcity uh, is uh, precisely that. It is, as, as Reverend Lips was saying earlier on, a lie that we have been told because, uh, you know, the, the, the boundary lines are boundaries of private property and money. Um, and again, the irony is that the people who are working, you know, incredibly hard, three jobs, commuting from one part of town to another uh, to, in order to be able to put food on the table are being paid so pitifully that uh, the, there's not enough money to be able to uh, make sure that you meet, you know, you make rent and you pay the bills and you survive a medical emergency and you feed your family. You have to pick maybe one or two out of four. And that, that scarcity is not that there's not enough food. It's not that there's not enough medical care. It's not that there's not enough places to live in America. There, we have all of those things. It's that they are rationed by a system where if you are working class, if you are poor in America and you don't have enough money, you will be put in jail for trying to access the things to which everywhere else in the world, many people just have a natural right. Right, and now, Overlay the the global pandemic, uh, COVID nineteen, and the, you know the 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 crippling you know issues that have rippled out of that crisis. Um, how 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 would you describe the last year and a half um, having changed things? What's now new? Well, Dawn, I mean, you know, I mean, globally, there were three things that were driving hunger to really unsustainable rates. Right? It was climate because climate change is a, is our thing, and frontline communities around the world already understand that uh you know uh, conflict is also important and horrific right you know the the, the arms industry in, in which uh the us is a particularly vile participant uh, has created uh you know, the sort of uh, cascades of conflict around the world uh and conflict means you know you, you you plant your seed and then you're driven out by the militia and you, you you can't harvest and you lose everything you own and you go hungry uh and then capitalism as i mentioned these three, these three c's were compounded by covid and what did that mean? That meant that all of a sudden, you know, very briefly, we were applauding the working poor uh, right. and saying, you know, thanks very much for you know, sure. delivering the groceries or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, working in the fields. But COVID was also a way of exposing disproportionately people of color and the working class to, um, you know, to, to COVID. I mean, here in Texas, for example, where were the hotspots for COVID? Uh, they were in places of, of uh, you know, carcerality and death. They were in the prison system and in the slaughterhouses, which were open specially uh, in order to make sure that our meat remained cheap no matter the cost. Uh, and so, you know, COVID on the one hand was a way of, you know, again, insulating the middle class by putting the bodies of poor people between COVID and, uh, you know, and the, the comfort of the rich. But it also offered a moment of recognizing that things could be different, that, uh, you know, all of a sudden we can spend and, you know, uh, you know the, the government can take vast amounts of action that, you know, 20 minutes ago, it was unconscionable that we should have such vast amounts of debt. And now, sure, we'll pay you to stay at home. We'll pay you to do the right thing. We'll pay you to take care of your, you know, your, your children and your family. Not for long, not enough, but we'll do it. Uh, and I think COVID also showed that while certain supply chains broke, there were other networks of care uh, that were possible, where all of a sudden, you know, you, you had these mutual aids uh, societies and groups and organizations providing food for, for one another in these networks of love 
that flourished despite the failure of government. Um, Absolutely. So it's a mixed bag with COVID, but, you know, I mean, and no one wants COVID to continue, but uh, I, I think COVID, you know, exacerbated the, the existing inequalities, but also showed us that, you know, just for a moment, things can be different. And it offers a, a moment of, for us to, to reckon with what that might mean for our, you know, for the food justice movement. Absolutely. And I think you're picking up even on the theme of our opening song, which is, you know, learning to love our people. We, we know how to love one another. And that's what we were doing in the in the throughout the pandemic and always. Um, but I think that's a really important uh, piece of this as well. Um, I want to welcome into the conversation Alison Cohen, um, who joins us from from Why Hunger in New York City. Hi, Alison. Um, Hi. <laughs> um, and so I, we have a question for you to, to jump in on, um, and that is, uh, what are some of the greatest myths and misconceptions around the work of food security? Great. Uh, I love that question because it lets me talk about one of my favorite uh, topics, which is narrative change, right? So uh, essentially, when you're talking about myths and misconceptions, you're saying, what's the dominant narrative? we're up against in our struggle for food justice. And um, it's one of those myths, of course, that, that Raj um, talked quite a bit about is scarcity. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna talk about a few others that I think um, are, are very particular to the United States and to the, the culture and, and our society here. So first I'd say, let's consider this, this widely accepted value of rugged individualism right, in our American culture, that we can all pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And if you just work hard enough, right, you can succeed. This is an old narrative. It's been around for a long, long time, but it is, it is very tenacious. Um, so one example of how these, these narratives that are so powerful can actually shape policy, this particular narrative really fueled the passage of the personal responsibility and work Opportunity Reconciliation Act of 1996, right? Welfare mm -hmm. reform, a plan intended to overhaul the nation's welfare system. Um, it would require work in exchange for assistance for a limited amount of time, right? So the, in my estimation, the act was both a result of and an attempt to really cement the dominant cultural lens that welfare dependency was a scourge on the American work ethic. Right. And that it could be eliminated by these laws that would promote work and marriage. And that's what it was rooted in. Years later, of course, no surprise, probably to many of us assembled here this evening, um, the studies that came out showed that while the number of welfare recipients re did decline, the number of families in poverty actually increased because of this Welfare Reform Act. Um, surprise, surprise. Incentivizing work and marriage didn't end poverty, right? Why is that? Because it turns out that work and the nuclear family do not correlate to higher income. A larger percentage, a large percentage of people that go to food banks on a regular basis that have come to rely on it as a de facto grocery store have at least one full-time working adult in their family, in their households. So the bootstraps myth is still going strong, I think as a foundational element of the dominant narrative and it has helped to really cement this American ideal of individualism and the Protestant work ethic. So I think it's a huge one that we're up against. Meanwhile, our collective stories that demonstrate that the true issues at the heart of poverty and hunger, from racism to economic justice, and the true solutions that require really, I would say, a fundamental dismantling of systems and institutions that are in service to capitalism and white supremacy. These have been intentionally invisibilized by those in power. So the moots, bootstraps myth um, that I just spoke about is, is one of our shared stories that makes up the dominant narrative of hunger in America. Here's a few others to consider that really have an impact on what has been um, lifted up as solutions to hunger, but in my opinion, are really false solutions. And those include the cultural of acceptance of hunger is something that will always be with us. Mm -hmm. Tina, there is no alternative. The poor will always be with us. The idea that it's really up to these good hearted volunteers and generous corporate actors to address hunger by capturing food waste and distributing it then to soup kitchens and pantries. Um, so surplus food for surplus people, some people say, which also serves to um, 
keep this food waste out of landfills. And so it's currently being framed as a solution to climate change as well. Another one is the personification of hunger as the nameless, faceless villain. So hunger is the villain. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that's what we need to fight. We're fighting hunger. Um, the acceptance that hunger is an individual problem, right? And so therefore it must be an individual solution, a lot like the, the Welfare Reform Act that we talked about. And then I think finally I would say that, that hunger and farming are not connected in, we, we don't think of them as connected only in so much as we buy into the story that industrial agriculture is necessary to feed the world. So again, getting back to Raja's um, scarcity uh, um, argument and, and myth. So it's the stories, I think, that really shape the dominant narrative that, that so many of us, millions of us, we've all accepted and spread. I would say since we were first instructed as, as a kindergartners, right, by our religious leaders, our teachers, our parents, to bring in food from our own kitchen pantries to share with those less fortunate, right? During the holiday season. Um, I was I was taught that way. That was something I had to do. Um, my children got the same message with, from their public school and it just, it, it, it's perpetuating this, this myth. And I think one recent example um, that I, I'd like to sort of lift up and just spend a couple of minutes on is, um, an example, a recent example of how these dominant narratives persist is the news stories that followed on the heels of the recently published USDA data about food insecurity figures for 2020. So the headlines, they were mostly along these lines. The percentage of American ho households that were food secure did not go up in 2020 amid major economic upheaval due to the pandemic. In 2020, just over 10% or 13.8 million households were food insecure. That rate is unchanged from 2019. So for those of us working on the front lines of emergency food distribu distribution during COVID, um, that kind of a headline, it just didn't match up with the experience, right, of, of folks who are shifting logistics um, in order to uh, to shift towards touchless services or moving staff from policy and organizing to um, handing out food um, to folks that were staying in the long lines. Um, and a need, a need that was so large that most operations wound up turning people away and they just simply um, weren't able to get enough food. Um, something about food supply chains being disrupted, I think, uh, which is another little tributary we could go down. However, a closer look at the data coupled with some of the surveys that were done by the Census Bureau during COVID, they really help us tell a different story. And I think this is where we have an opportunity, as Raj was saying, to really lean into a different narrative. So food insecurity actually doubled at the height of the pandemic. There were many, many people, I know some folks talked about this earlier today, many people that were um, for the first time finding themselves in, in food bank lines. The only real reason, the real reason, the only reason we're ending this year with a relatively stable food insecurity rate compared to 2019 is that direct cash payments helped the millions who were newly in financial crisis during COVID. And that's so, so critical. Turned out that some some form of universal basic income, cash payments mm -hmm. actually worked. Turns out poverty is really the root cause of hunger. That would have been the, the, the greatest headline to hear. Um, another thing is that a stable food insecurity rate, it's still a bad one. We're still talking about 10% yeah. of the population. It is not, Never. you know, um, and, and with some of these supports now going away, we'll, we'll see how long it stays stable at, at, at 10%. And then the last thing that, that we didn't hear much about is that race matters in these issues and the gap is widening. So Latinx households, um, it, the racial disparities in food securities, it didn't shift, but it got it stayed the same for Latinx households, but it got worse times three for black households. Now triple the white rates of white households that are food insecure. So I, I guess I, I'm bringing all this up to say that that the myths and and misconceptions around food insecurity are deeply linked to 
um, the, the stories that we tell and continue to lift up about who's the villain, who's the hero in the story. Um, when you paint hunger as, as the villain, then, then, um, then we're, we're constantly going after feeding people as, as, as opposed to understanding really what is the, the underlying dominant um, oppressive power that we need to dismantle. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those reflections. Um, I would like to uh, welcome Keith Bullard and Lou Aya to back to the conversation. Hi, Keith. Keith's coming in from North Carolina, um, from Fed Up, and uh, Lou is coming in from where are you located, Lou? Peace. Uh, I'm here in Ohlone Lashawn territory, also known as Oakland. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, um, so, so giving a little bit of feedback. Okay, there we go. Um, so turning to the two of you, I would like to ask how you see uh, the myths and misperceptions that we've been talking about so far. How do you see that manifesting in grassroots or community organizing around food justice? Um, and you know what's and and how those myths and perceptions limit. Um, what we think uh, is possible or necessary in order to really um, have a right to food. Yeah. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Keith Bullard. I'm a coordinator of uh, NC Raise Up, which is the Fight for 15 here in the uh, Carolinas. Also uh, a part of Fed Up uh, Political Food Distribution. And uh, happy Fed Thank you Up for that. <laughs> So uh, just to piggyback uh, real quick off of uh, um, Allison's uh, uh, last uh, statement that she had made where she said, you know, we tend to fight, you know, hunger and not the, you know, not the causes uh, of it and things. And I think a lot of those things happens uh, when you have uh, really great, you know, people, uh, big hearted, amazing people. Yeah that see a need in a community that uh that feel compelled to uh be to to give uh to the, that community but um don't fight the root causes of what caused hunger in that community in the first place um it's kind of they kind of act as a crutch to the uh system in the sense it's almost like the the system has food assistance uh uh, uh benefits and, uh, you know, we have to, you know, begin to, as we see these needs in our community, I think the first thing is recognize that these are our communities and focus on being uh, building communities and not, you know, uh, going in and helping out in the community and saying, you know, great job, but, but focusing on how can we build uh, in this community and be a part of this community and uh, become a part of the community. Uh, which means, you know, uh, really uh, getting to know the people and hearing their stories. And I think just hearing the stories will fight back against some a lot of those myths. But when you begin to do those things, you begin to uh, challenge why is people hungry in the first place? Mm -hmm. Why do we have to be, you know, open on this on, on this Friday delivering these things when just like, you know, Raj has stated earlier, there's so much food. And, and it's not and not a, 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 sit, a situation as it uh, was described as like, hey, you know, let's um, uh, with with uh, soup kitchen and things, giving out the waste to the community and things. It's not even about giving out the waste. It's enough food to be able for everyone to be able to uh, have, you know, uh, healthy food and things and just food in general. But, um, you know, we have as as uh, people that engage in the struggle have to also, you know, uh, engage in it, uh, facing the fact of challenging the system of why do we even have to do this? And as you are uh, going in this program, you know, going on in, in the struggle, educating those along the way so that we don't have to uh, continue to uh you know, put our, you know, bring our food uh, and bring everything together so that we can piece meals together just so all of us can have barely enough. Mm -hmm. enough. So I think it's, you know, uh, the first myth that I would say is uh, challenging the, the this this Good Samaritan, uh, you know, charity uh, type of uh, mentality and really uh, 
think about it as a way of uh, combating a system that causes uh, hunger in the first place. Uh, that'd be, you know, one of the myths. Yeah, how'd we get here in the first place? Um, Lou, turning to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for that, Keith. I'm, I'm really wanting to respond as a cultural worker, you know, someone who works with communities to compose songs that really speak directly to their reality so that people can not just uh, hear a demand, uh, but feel it, mm. right? Feel the truth of their story. And so one of the groups that I've been honored to work with is the Coalition of Immokalee Workers uh, in South Florida. And working with them, what I've been able to do is just simply say, like, all right, let's get in a circle. And within the circle, there is so many powerful stories that now it's our job. And those stories will be about hunger. They'll be about suffering. They'll be about being far from home. They'll be about being having your human rights disrespected in the fields as our relatives who are doing that work are. Like That's going to be the story. And so instead of all, for me as a cultural worker, right, or as a musician, as an artist, as a poet, I'm not looking uh, to uh, the people who try to define the narrative and try to really even, even fight with them. I'm looking to our community who has powerful truth to share. And so the myth is who can create, in some ways for me, is, who, who is who, who's telling the, the most important story. And I don't care if it's only, if it's not on CNN, but it's only from one, you know, person picking tomatoes to the person next to them telling the story uh, of, of dignity, of justice. That's the story that we got to bring to the, to, to the streets, to the people, to the online airwaves, all of that. And so as a cultural worker, again, we get in that circle, we look at each other and we begin to compose. And so, I mean, to be honest with you, I, it's, my, it's one of my favorite things in the world to bring the, the voices and the, the poetry of the people into spaces where they normally aren't. So right here, we're, we're mid panel. We opened up with a song, but I want to show, share the words of a, a poet named Lupe, who's a farm worker and organizer. For, uh, and I just want to, she, she said it like this. Nuestros cuerpos no son máquinas y nuestra dignidad no está a la venta. No está a la venta. Es cierto que somos capaz de construir la paz con este pueblo, con este pueblo. And so, for our relatives that don't understand Spanish right away, what Lupe is articulating with that poem that was then set to a melody uh, was that our bodies are not machines uh, and our dignity is not for sale. Right? Then it's then the truth is that we have the capacity to build peace with with the people. And that truth right there is the one that is like that's where the, the, the myths get broken about hunger. Yes, on a systematic level. I love the work that my comrades are doing on this on this panel right now. I love and respect to y'all. Thank you for helping us understand it on a systemic level. And the beauty and power and the truth that comes out of our people living it every day. Not just um not again, not just in an article. But with the beauty of art, you know, with the sound of a song, right, in which we can really fully feel each other. Thanks so much. Um, and, you know, the Poor People's Campaign song of everybody has the right to live, they have the right to love, we have the right to feel joy and happiness along with that pain and suffering. Um, and so thank you so much for sharing uh, your insights with us. I would like to welcome um, Maureen Taylor to join us now. Um, and Maureen is a lifelong soldier in the war against uh, against poverty. Um, Maureen, thank you so much for joining us. I, uh, you are coming to us from uh, the Michigan Welfare Rights Organization in Michigan. Yeah, um, right. All right, thanks for joining us. Um, I have a question here that I wanted to share with you and get your thoughts. Um, okay. In August, when SNAP was expanded, Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack said, we may have a constitution and a declaration of independence. But, but if we had 42 million Americans who were going hungry, really hungry, they wouldn't be happy and there would be a political instability. Is he right? And is SNAP expansion enough? Uh, the answer to the first question is no. And the answer to the second question is no. So, uh, 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 I wanted to address this and I'm just feeling so comfortable 
uh, being in uh, a space with uh, like-minded colleagues. And so I'm not going to comment a whole lot about what Uncle Tom said. I'm sure he's somebody's uncle. So what Uncle Tom said, I'll just let it stand. But I wrote a few notes. Uh, uh, I'm a, I work with the National Welfare Rights Union, and we're engaged across the country to talk about these uh, issues, primarily how to eliminate poverty, and certainly hunger, homelessness, all of those are, are part of the fight that we've been waging since, uh, a lot of us, since 1966. So I wrote a few notes so I could stay within the time <laughs> limit uh, that I was allotted. And let me just read a couple of things. Uh, again, uh, comrades, we have stumbled into an area that requires a deep analysis of the components that are involved. An understanding of the roots of food insecurity is needed if we are to devise a response that carefully addresses food justice. Low-income populations have a unique perspective on food justice because, as already stated, if you are a welfare recipient, food injustice has been a crisis for you every day. The average family of three, head of household and two children, is eligible to receive approximately $7.90 per day in food stamps or about $2.63 per meal. This figure hasn't changed very much in over 40 years. Near the end of the Great Depression, it was discovered again that young men being readied for war were not fit for duty because so many were suffering from malnutrition. Mm. Food stamps came about in 1939 as these troops needed to carry 30 or 40 or 50 pounds of military equipment and they just couldn't do it. The point is, is that there is a political rationale for, for why food injustice exists in America. Food justice defined should be looked at in several categories. For instance, access to nutritional food. Is there adequate transportation? Mm -hmm. Affordability of nutritional food. Are there resources available to buy good things? And the third point is the quality of the food appropriate and available everywhere. A deeper understanding should reveal that the political essence of food justice is based in a class analysis that suggests limitations to food supplies are tied to limitations of resources. What might food justice look like if the access questions, the affordability questions, if those questions were removed from this political formula. Well, what it would mean is that a person or a family with limited resources would not be punished because they were poor. They would be allowed two jars or three jars of peanut butter or, or a, 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 a cereal instead of a one box, maybe two boxes. Whatever it is that the family needed because their food stamps would be open-ended meaning that whatever you purchase would be reimbursed by the state or the federal government with no limitations. Food justice would mean that pantries, soup kitchens would operate on an emergency basis, meaning that, for instance, if a house caught fire, the food, car, the food pantry would be available to substitute a meal for that evening. And the family would be eligible ongoing for meals as needed with no restrictions. Food justice would be an ongoing challenge to manifest itself under the current economic system. So the correct response for all of us is to call for a systemic change in the American economy that offers sustenance based on need and not on the ability to pay. Now, how we get there is what we are called to defend and design. And I say we should get there the sooner, the better. Yeah. The kind of work that we do at welfare rights involves itself with ground level involvement. People come to us and they say, my food stamps were cut off and I don't know why. People come to us and say, our rent is cut off 
I can't figure out what to do and I don't know why. So as we engage individuals on the street level, we aggregate all of the details that we learn. How did this happen to you? What happened to you? And from that, we're able to come up with policy questions and changes that we want to recommend, little bitty changes that seem little bitty, but we're on our way to having more and more people get themselves involved in a conversation that says capitalism is not your friend, it's not your buddy. You are not going to fare well if you continue to support it. So I would tell all of my colleagues that are on this line, and again, I feel so comfortable with all the folks that I hear, that the fight that we're in is a tough fight, but there are a whole lot of people that are sick to death of this crap that's going on, especially as we are watching Haitians trying to get into Texas, Hispanics trying to get into wherever they trying to get into, and that's because all of them have been told in America, life is good. Gold, dollar bills, $10 bills, $20 bills are on the streets. And all you have to do is get there. And then after two or three or four weeks of treacherous travel, they get here and folks won't even offer them a glass of water or a sandwich. It's now the truth. Uh, my name is Maureen Taylor. I serve as state chairperson of the Michigan Welfare Rights Organization. I'm also a board member of the National Welfare Rights Union, and I ain't scared. Thanks so much, Maureen. And standing beside you, I'm not scared either, I have to All say. All right, now. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I'd like to welcome back Raj and uh, Reverend Liz to the conversation. Um, hi, Raj. And Liz will pop back up here in this magic that we have going on. Okay, here we are. All right. So thanks for coming back. Um, historically, organizations like the Black Panther Party, the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, welfare rights organizations have allowed, and welfare rights organizations have allowed impacted people to advocate for themselves in their own words and with their own experiences. And so seized seeds for some of the most powerful anti-poverty programs that we have. I think many people don't know this history um, and it's one that needs to be studied very closely. Um, those organizations put together school lunch programs, uh, Head Start, and more uh, solutions that still prove to be invaluable today. Uh, these organizations engaged in projects of survival, uh, which which are you know directly meeting people's needs. Uh, but these projects aren't sort of just projects; they don't stop there. They're part of a broader po approach of politicizing people, of organizing people, of building networks and building infrastructure, deep organizing, of cultural work, bringing you know families and song and hearts and food straight to the center of the, all of that activity. Um, also engaging our faith traditions and our spirituality, um, as well as, you know, digging into to deep policy and, uh, and research uh, work to really arm ourselves with the kinds of knowledge and tools that we need to make the change that we so desperately need. And the question I have for the two of you to talk about um, is in what ways do we see the legacy present um, of those organizations in our organizations today? And what more do we need? How are our times different today than that might um, require some different aspects? Reverend Liz, you wanna- Who wants to jump in first? <laughs> you go for it, Raj, and then I'll, I'll come in. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> no, you. Honestly, it's it's so hard to to follow comrades like Alison, Lou, Keith, and of course Maureen um, with a, a, an analysis that's that y'all don't already know. So maybe I, I should um, draw on something that happened here in Texas, just because again, comrade Maureen just made me think about it right now, uh, and it's an important history. Not many people know about it. It's it's about the pecan shellers strike that happened here. Uh, in San Antonio. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one of the leaders of that uh, was a woman, uh, Emma Tanayuka, uh, and her family was uh, indigenous and settler, uh, and it, you know, she, she was uh, an organizer in the Communist Party uh, in a, a bit of the food system that required, uh, that recruited overwhelmingly women uh, and usually Mexican women uh, to shell pecans, you know, d down the road uh, here and uh, just in San Antonio, um, the the wages were horrible, uh, and the you know, in the end uh, there was a strike, 
And initially, uh, the, the response of the the, uh, the employers was to close down the food stations that uh, the, the strikers set up. Um, but in the end, the strike swelled, and it became not just a strike about wages, but a strike about care, a strike about the quality of food, a strike about um, the, the the immigration and enforcement uh, police at the time. So they, they, this was one of the strikes that was also about border patrol. And of course, it was about sexism. Uh, and what that reminds us is that you know, whether it's the Southern Tenants uh, and uh, Workers Union or whether it's the Black Panthers, um, beneath uh, this organizing was always, frankly, communism. Uh, there, there was always a story about uh, not, not only is capitalism bad, but there's an alternative and we're going to break the narrative and we're going to organize around it and we're going to use our meals as moments of poetry because, you know, we're, we're here to talk about food. One of the great things about organizing with food is that it's delicious and you do it three times a day and food recruits. Uh, and I, I think what one of the, the, the important things that's different now, first of all, you know, we, we've grown up hearing that communism is bad and socialism is awful. Uh, and so much has to be unlearned uh, in the organizing around the resuscitation of these ideas. Plus, now we've got the climate crisis. Uh, and we're living on the brink of the sixth extinction. We're living through the sixth extinction. Uh, that's not something that uh, antecedents necessarily uh, had to grapple with. Um, and you know, that's a layer of despair and sadness and hurt that Lou mentioned right at the beginning. That's real, and that anxiety will make us cry, and it will it will hurt. Uh, and I think part of the one of the, one of the, the sort of duties of organizing is yes, survival pending revolution. But this revolution has to be a revolution of care. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a revolution that is much, you know, is, is very openly about how it is that we need to, to love one another. And, you know, for, for you know, my, my comrades who are on the front lines, comrades like, you know, Keith and Maureen, who are doing this hard work, it's so hard um, to, to feel that love and to hold that space of despair. And I'm so honored that you do it. Um, but I, I've, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just here to, 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 I, to, I, to stutter, essentially, <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, to just to thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, and also, I guess, just, in, just to end up, I mean, the, the, the joy is we're not alone. I mean, what, one of the things yeah. about Amatanayuka was that she was an agent of international solidarity, right? We, we often we forget that the, America is just one country in a fairly large planet, although we're doing our best to, to screw the rest of the planet yeah. up. Uh, there are people who are rooting for movements uh, you know, like, you know, the, the, I mean, like the Poor People's Campaign. Um, and when I was, I, I worked with, with comrades in Malawi and we, we came to the United States to, to talk to, to movement leaders here around the food justice movement. And there was so much resonance between some of the work that's happening with poor farmers in Malawi and some of the work that's happening in frontline communities here uh, in the United States. And it's important to remember that we're not alone. Uh, and we're not alone just in this, in this, you know, in our cities and in our homes, but in, in, in this world, because it's a long struggle and sometimes it does get lonely. Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate what you were um, saying, uh, Raj, and it made me think of actually a, a favorite quote of, of Dr. King's that I wanted to share and then and then comment back on the question. But uh, in 67, when he puts out the where do we go from here, chaos or community, uh, mm. uh, he, he offers this kind of commentary on his moment. But I think it's it's speaking to that kind of critique of inequality, the critique of capitalism that that everyone here is speaking to and that you were just raising. He says, the contemporary tendency in our society is to base our distribution on scarcity, which has vanished, and to compress our abundance into the overfed mouths of the upper classes until they gag with superfluity. If democracy is to have breath of meaning, it is necessary to adjust this inequity. It is not only moral, it is also intelligent. And when I think about the question of moral and intelligent leadership, it leads me to the grassroots leaders who are fighting every day across this country, across this world, leaders like we've seen this evening in Maureen Taylor and Keith Bullard and Lou Aya and Alison Cohen, um, who wake up every day uh, in different situations, in different settings, um, and think about what is it gonna take for us to not just meet people's immediate needs, 
but to actually build a movement. Um, a movement is only the only thing that has ever been able to be powerful enough, influential enough, big enough, beautiful enough to, to be able to actually overcome you know, deep poverty, deep inequality, deep grave injustice. And, and so you know, when we're looking at these questions of, of hunger, when we're looking at uh, food deserts, when we're thinking about uh, grocery store workers who can't afford groceries, um, then it's not going to be one program. It's not going to be one policy. It's not going to be one mutual solidarity project. It's going to be the building of a movement led by those most impacted, who are intelligent and moral leaders, who are going to be able to come forward, again, not just, as we say in the Poor People's Campaign, cursing the darkness, but actually shining a light on what is possible and, and what is necessary uh, to be able to kind of lift the load of hunger and poverty and inequality. And, and again, if we, if we look at these examples um, of movements, of multiracial groups of poor people coming together when folks say that's not possible. Well, well, it has happened and it's happening again. Um, and so you can't say it's impossible because it's it's reality. And, and at this point to see then both in history and in today, folks coming together, you know, have, uniting around a vision, a program, uh, putting together a, a sophisticated, even if we're poor, media strategy, you know, making sure that we're developing lots of different leaders. And then we're, we're meeting people's immediate needs, not as an end, but as a means to be able to build a, a bigger movement. It's going to take a movement. It's going to take the power of millions of people coming together and saying it does not have to be this way, not waiting for folks to, to save us. Um, instead, as, as you were saying, Dawn, when we look at the current policies that are in front of us and when we look at historic you know, change, where that has come is out of folks that are compelled into motion, right? I think about uh, Nick Smith, a, a fast food worker um, from Appalachian, Virginia, who, who at a Poor People's Campaign uh, rally said, our backs are against the wall and what we can do, all we can do is push. Right. And so people are being compelled in this very moment, in this moment of history to to not just, you know, try to to survive, but to push back against a system that is intent on on killing, not just, you know, one or two people, but a whole section of our population. But folks aren't just laying over and dying, as we're seeing people across the country, as we have done in history, you know, are coming together and saying it doesn't have to be this way. And, and we we can do better. We must. And, and we are. And and this is you know, we're not going to look to to Congress and the White House for that moral, intelligent leadership. So it's more helpful when there is more moral and more intelligent leadership in those positions of power. But but again, where we get his start, where we get um this child tax credit wasn't from policy wonks. It wasn't just a great idea that some folks came up with in the midst of a pandemic. It's it's what welfare rights leaders have been advocating and pushing for 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 decades. And and any win that we have is because there are people that are impacted who are out there pushing, 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 being persistent, and and winning and saying there is victory here in this struggle um, and in our coming together. Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, we have so much to dive into. I'm doing just a quick uh, time check. It's 8.04 and we go till 8.30. So I wanted to open up and invite anyone who is following along um, online to share questions that you have um, via uh, Facebook or via um, uh, YouTube. I believe those are the avenues that you can plug in your questions. Um, and uh, Raj, were you going to say something there? No, um, I'm not seeing a question uh, right now. So I wanted to um, 
maybe ask, um, I have so many questions swirling around in my mind and I have a sort of captive audience with the two of you. So I'm curious if I can, if you can indulge me, I've heard a lot about uh, capitalism tonight, which isn't always something that I hear, you know, much in my day to day, despite the overarching presence of, of, our, of our failing system and our, you know, in its advanced stages. Uh, and we're seeing sort of all of the fallout of that. But I think it's so hegemonic and ever present that it's, it's almost invisible uh, in some ways, um, in a strange irony. So I'm curious, um, you know, I also hear, you know, older models of, of other times, but curious um, your thoughts on, um, on, on what kind of new way we can create to work with, with one another. I think Raj, you said that we're seeing communities are um, coming together, the fabric of communities to care for, for one another. And that is not um, a profitable system, you know? So how do we, how do we lean into um, the, the, the goodness of our humanity to take care of, of each other and to build new models and what kind of models are we seeing arise? Um, I mean, if, if I can just kick it off, the, the kinds of things I've been excited about have uh, happened in the pandemic, uh, really led by young people and led by peasant movements and led by indigenous movements. Uh, and that's not surprising because uh, in general, those are the movements uh, in the global south, at least, that have really been on the short end of the, you know, of the state yeah. when it comes to development. And so, you know, when you think about autonomism, when you think about, for example, in Colombia, there have been these huge protests. I don't know if, if folk have been following them, but one of the first demands of, of young people on the streets of Colombia has been for food sovereignty. Uh, and that's, you know, that, that, that seems an unusual thing until you recognize that behind that, uh, the, those demands for transformative change are really well-reasoned arguments around what the you know, what the government should be doing, what society needs to be doing to make sure that nobody goes hungry in these times. And then you know, I've just you know finished reading. I'm I'm, I'm just gonna uh, this fantastic book called Hungry for Revolution. It's about um, Chile uh, before the before uh, the CIA and U.S. sponsored uh, coup in Chile. One of the the things that was tremendously important uh, for making sure that everyone got to eat were these workers' committees that manage prices. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why food is cheap in the United States and still no one can afford it is because workers aren't paid well along the supply chain. And then you have to sort of suffer the consequences of that uh, when you're, you know, when the, the money just runs out. And these, uh, you know, essentially sort of people's groceries and people's supermarkets were created as a way of making sure that not only do you, do you make sure you know, that, that there's food available, but that workers all along the way were treated well. Uh, and that's a, a big shift from the kinds of logic you know, that, that capitalism imposes on us, which is, you know, we just it just must be cheap and available and then we'll figure the rest out later on. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I do think that there are models from history um, and you know, models that were ex extinguished not so long ago. But I also think, look, in, in the future, there are new models that we can and should go for. I mean, I, I don't want to have the kind of diet that, uh, you know, of, of sort of borscht and, and bad communist food that, that flourished in Eastern <laughs> Europe. Um, but that's the joy of reinventing ourselves, right? I mean, the, the, it's slow food, uh, an organization that people may associate with sort of food snobbery, was actually started up by a bunch of anarchists and communists who said, look, actually, pleasure needs to be democratized. We can't have a food movement without recruiting through pleasure, through joy, through poetry, through music. And all of this is embodied in food in a ways in ways that indigenous movements and, and peasant movements have really you know have gotten to, to grips with. So you know if, if you're interested, look up some of the, the autonomous work coming from La Via Campesina and uh, happening particularly in, in Colombia right now. I'm very excited about that. So I love this idea, um, especially of of the kind of the beauty and the and the the fact that that poor people and all people deserve beauty um, and and. Uh, and life and and abundance and you know I'm a biblical scholar um, so I, I spend a bunch of time uh, in in systems and structures from thousands of years ago right <laughs> um, and then I'm also an organizer and I spend lots of time in systems and structures today and and I see a similarity um, in the biblical empires that are critiqued um, as well as the empire that we're living in. Um, you know, in this moment. And, and, and one of the things that I love from those biblical texts that I read that, that surely critique empire and say, you know, we don't have to have anyone in need, anyone in hunger amongst us 
um, if we actually just society, organize society around the needs of, uh, of everyone, but starting with the poor, uh, which is what Deuteronomy, which is what Leviticus, which is what our sacred texts all are talking about. It's what the, the first Christian communities organized themselves around. Anyone who was in need, they were taken care of. Um, and, and how a society was judged, how a nation was judged was, are you um, feeding everyone? Are you housing everyone? Are you making sure everyone has health care? Um, are you making sure that you're lifting from the bottom so everybody rises, right? And, and one of the things that's beautiful then in those biblical critiques of empire is also uh, this, this embracing of abundance and beauty and luxury for the poor, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of my, one of the passages, you know, that I heard Allison kind of referring to that's this kind of hegemonic idea that the poor will be with you always, right? Well, well where this, this passage comes from is a scene where Jesus is at dinner with his closest friends. It's the Last Supper. And uh, a woman comes in. We don't know where she comes from. Is she a prostitute? Is she a sex worker? Is she someone who's stolen a bunch of, of money from someone? And But she comes and she anoints Jesus. And, and one of the references of that anointing is about how the poor deserve good things, beautiful things, luxurious things. And, and I think we, we don't want to get away from just like, oh, well, we can survive on a couple dollars a day. And, and we just want a little more food stamps and we want, you know, slightly better uh, uh, welfare benefits. And, but no, no, we want it all and we can have it all and we can have it in a sustainable way that, that um, where the society of empire is not sustainable but a, a society that that allows for there to be sustainability and abundance for the poor and for everyone is is the the kind of society that we're we're trying to organize ourselves into. And so the Poor People's Campaign has put together, you know, a moral budget, um, and we show that it's not that it's too costly to actually eliminate poverty. Mm -hmm. That child poverty in the United States costs our society one trillion dollars a year. So yeah. so it's too costly not to do something about it. Um, and, and, and what we can do is, you know, raise taxes on the, those that can afford it, you know, cut the military budget and invest, you know, put money into, into food systems, into climate resilient jobs, into, into education, into lifting from the bottom. Um, and that can fundamentally restructure society and it can make it a place that everybody, uh, does actually thrive. And, um, but but also enjoys and celebrates and and has beautiful things because that's that's the kind of world um, at least uh, from my readings and my understanding as a Christian pastor that God desires for us all. It's so important, and I, I you know I'm even thinking as both of you are talking, I'm thinking in this advanced capitalist moment that we're in right now, time is luxury. So you know. People who are, you know, our bodies are not machines. We cannot luxuriate in time to raise families, for example, to care for loved ones, to care for elders. This, these things are luxuries that have been commodified for other people to do for low wages. Um, and that breaks down, you know, the soul of what, you know, of our, of our, our nation, I think. Um, and so I really, um, I really resonate with what you all are, are, are sharing tonight. Um, I'm seeing some more questions coming in um, through the chat. And I have one uh, for Keith. So um, I will invite Keith uh, to join us. Um, and the question is asking you to, to just share more about um, your work that combines political education uh, with, uh, with food distribution, which would be sort of characterized as a project of survival in the way that we were talking about it earlier. Yes. Uh, so with Fed Up, there's three main goals. There is to meet the acute needs of people. It is to politically educate people on why we're in this situation and to also organize them. Uh, and, and that is uh, one of the biggest difference uh, from this project than, you know, most food banks or, or, or pantry is the political uh, uh, education and uh, uh, organizing of it. And we combine those two uh, as, as one of the uh, really strong points that we tr uh, ensure that we hit. And every distribution, 
uh, there's there's opportunity to have conversation. We make sure that we take the time to not just look at people as a number for one, because first is the the, the face in everything that we do. There's a form of uh, uh, political education, you know, in it with with questions and and all of that. How we are with uh, uh, in the community uh, is a form of education. But when people come, we make sure that we we take the time, like I said, not to look at them as a number or a car just in a line. Uh, uh, but we make sure that we talk to them. Hey, how are you? You know, how long have you been in this community? You know, uh, immediately getting to know them and hearing their issues and what resonates with them. Uh, you know, there's there's a, a weekly, uh, bi-weekly uh, political discussions that goes on where we bring those same questions that, that we ask uh, in the distributions. We bring them to the space. We, uh, we make sure that the space is open where people can really ask the questions that that may be intimidating to ask uh, in, in some other spaces. You know, why is everybody on my block? I see everybody on my block in this line. You know, or, hey, can I get a few bags for a couple of my neighbors? You know, that is a space where it's like, well, if why, you know, why do all of you all uh, need food, you know, or in this situation? Uh, but so we make sure that we take the time to have uh, uh, individual conversations with people, uh, but also bringing people together, like I said, in this broader community building setting where we are uh, talking about issues that impact our community. And when we talk about fed up, because fed up is a political food distribution, but we make sure to say that we're fed up with the system. We're fed up with uh, insecure housing. We're fed up with the lack of health insurance, uh, health coverage. You know, so it's not we're fed up with with uh, low wages. We're fed up with, uh, you know, the 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 lack of protections when it comes to uh, uh, COVID and other uh, uh, unsafe working conditions. So, you know, we bring all those issues into the space when we have in our community discussions and our one on one discussions. But we also leave literature as well in the bags. And which was it? Uh, it was really beautiful. Uh, a couple uh, about two weeks ago, where you know we we've ever since we started, we've put you know information about the program. We make sure we add historical context, so it talks about you know the landless workers movement in Brazil, and it talks about uh, the Black Panther Party, uh, you know, uh, free breakfast programs and their uh, projects of survival. You know, we make sure that. You know, we add those in there, but we also add, you know, little things as uh, recipes. You know, if you're getting, you know, these these this fresh produce and this food and things, you know, here go some uh, healthy recipes or some, you know, really great recipes that you can, you know, uh, try have. Uh, we put, you know, we recently had a back to school rally where we had coloring books. Uh, may you know that that was a that was you know geared at politically educate even the youth so while the parents have you know information on you know this big topic of capitalism and why we are here and all of this <laughs> the kids are while they're coloring and drawing they're learning you know about you know uh fighters that that have been in this fight in the past they're being asked questions that they will understand and, uh, you know, and so there's there's all of these things that go on. And the beauty of it is two weeks ago, uh, someone came into uh, our office that I did not know. And I overheard a conversation of them talking about this program called Fed Up and how much that they learned. Now, honestly, I'm like, OK, how many, you know, how much of this information really is someone like who? Yeah. Past the tomatoes, this piece of paper is really great. But she came in there not knowing that I was part of the project, but really sincerely talking about how much she learned, how she's take this information and she goes over with her children, how her and her mom begin after they get to they they discuss and have a conversation. These are things that these this is the this is the dream of Fed Up is that these conversations will begin to, to organically happen in the home, but also in the community. 
you know, so that when a community is beginning to talk about these issues, you can't just talk about how bad it is without coming up with solutions. And they have the solutions. We have the solutions and our community is getting us uh, um, uh, educated on the, the tools that we have at hand and also getting us organized to take action. You know, so, you know, like I said, we meet the acute needs with just the food distribution, but making sure that we really politically educate people on 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 the on the issues that matter to them most. Uh, and also we organize to come up with strategies on how do we get in step to begin to change it. Thanks so much, Keith. Um, I think, you know, this question of political education, it, you know, it might seem abstract to some li listeners, you know, what, what are we talking about? But clearly it's, you know, it's explaining that the question of why are we at where, where why are we where we are? Um, and even the question of civic education, you know, do, do, does, do, do people understand that we collect, you know, we pay taxes and those taxes are, that's the public purse, that's our money. So then the decisions that are being made, um, Reverend Liz was talking about a moral budget, you know, even at a city level or a county level, what are those budgets? Well, who, what are those decisions that are being made on our behalf? And I think it's particularly interesting in light of uh, the pandemic, there are these federal funds coming down to cities and municipalities through the American Rescue Plan that are intended in the guidance from the Treasury Department to be delivered to those most most impacted by the pandemic and you know those those decisions are being made on a whole variety of different with a whole bunch of different criteria um, and so I think you know this political education you know is 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 can happen at the very local level you know plug into what your city council is talking about plug into what your county council is talking about um, and see you know particularly around this issue of hunger how can we invest in our food systems in such a way that changes the system and doesn't just promote additional charity. So, um, or the need for additional charity. Um, anyways, I won't go down that further down that rabbit hole, but wanted to um, thank you for, for your, your comments there, um, Keith. And we have other questions in the chat. Unfortunately, we're running a little thin on time here. So I wanna offer um, our, our, our panelists uh, a last uh, opportunity to share just a, a quick reflection um, if, if you would like to, I'm not sure how this works with the, the screen situation, but I don't know if, if maybe we want to uh, welcome Allison and um, see, see if you have something you want to share as we're wrapping up. Um, just really briefly, um, this has been, uh, I've learned so much. I'm, I'm really thrilled to uh, be in this space with all of you. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I, I loved the the I loved going down the path, listening to you all go down the path around joy and um, and uh, the need for that um, in our movements. I think is really is really central and critical. And so, thank you for the opportunity to be with you all. And um, and I will pass it to Maureen. Oh, okay. Um, critical to this conversation is that the voices of the victims of poverty have to be lifted and have to be included in the room. The reason all of our money is collected in a big bag called taxes is cause somebody said that's what we should do. But then somebody else makes the decision on what happens. And I'm just gonna end a very quick statement. Uh, one of my favorite readings, uh, Ezekiel was at home sleeping, minding his own business. And uh, he heard of some rustling, and it was the Lord to say, "Hey Zeke, come, come on, I, I, let, let me show you something." And Ezekiel went with the Lord, and the Lord said, "Look out there, what do you see?" And Zeke looked. He said, "Well, I heard the bones of dead soldiers." And the question came, and the Lord said, "Well, do you think those uh, bones can live? Can those bones lead?" So Zeke looked out there and he said, well, Lord, if you say they can, they can. And that was the end of the story. And the end of the story at welfare rights is the same thing. The welfare mother, the welfare father, who are the dead out there believing they have no spiritual value, believing they have no worth, those are the bones. And those bones can lead. And those are the bones that the hair is falling out. 
they overweight, all kind of problems, but they are the experts in terms of how it is to be hungry. So I would just end this conversation by saying Zeke was right and the people on this panel, those dry bones can not only live, but they can lead. Maureen Taylor, Welfare Rights. I'll go back on mute. <laughs> Thanks, Maureen. And let's see if we uh, have another person join us. Uh, I don't know if maybe Lou would like to, well, Lou's gonna close us out. Um, maybe I'll ask Raj if you would like to share some final thoughts. Uh, j just very briefly, again, it's it's impossible to follow Maureen because <laughs> she's amazing and always right. Uh, but uh, I, I did want to just lift up the voice of a, a, a friend and comrade who is in South Africa right now. T today is uh, a, a big day at the United Nations. There's, there's meant to be a food systems summit that was going to offer solutions on how we would address the problems we've been talking about here. Unfortunately, it was a summit that was overtaken essentially by corporations and most movements worth a damn have been on the outside of it. Um, but in that process, mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, a, 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 a friend of Yarl's uh, and uh, a friend of mine, uh, Subu Zikode of uh, the South African Abashlali Basem Jondolo Shack Dwellers Movement, um, had an amazing speech uh, on food sovereignty and hunger. Uh, and I, I would just encourage folks to, uh, Abashlali is not, not an easy thing to spell, but uh, Zikode is Z Z I K O D E. Google him uh, and uh, just uh, do. Uh, pay attention to, to the to the words and the wisdom uh, and the compassion and the anger and how they all come together in this call for uh, for food justice and his leadership uh, along with the leadership of poor people around the world is uh, something that I'm very pleased to be following and I'm uh, honored to have just been part of this conversation as well it's uh, incredible and I've learned a great deal thank you so much Thanks so much, Raj. And perhaps we could ask our friends at the Cairo Center to find a recording of that speech and post it on social media. I would love to listen to it. Um, I will uh, turn to Liz. Yeah, I don't have much to say. And I, I was thinking about Sabu's um, beautiful, beautiful words, um, uh, just as you were saying them, Raj. And so thanks for, for raising them. And, and surely uh, we will uh, post um, uh, the remar remarks that he wrote down. And um, I just want us to kind of to, to sit in, in the challenge and in the inspiration that Maureen just gave us, um, that, that indeed uh, the dry bones of scarcity and hunger and uh, the destruction of our, our environment, the, the kids that are being taken away from their families because uh, they can't afford housing or water or, or adequate food, um, the, the dry bones of racism and police brutality um, and of uh, the kind of vaccine apartheid that we're seeing or, or the unjust immigration policies where we have folks, you know, at the border in Texas um, who are just being uh, beaten and treated as inhumane um, uh, as, as can be, as can even, we can't even conceptualize it. We can't even understand it. Um, but that, that these dry bones in, indeed can can live and 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 can lead and and the words of Frederick Douglass are coming through my mind of um, those who would be free must strike the first blow, those in pain know when their pain is re is relieved and indeed there is a powerful movement growing across this world um, that is led by these intelligent and moral leaders who are uh, uh, who have nothing to lose but um, the chains of oppression and whose backs are against the wall and are pushing and pushing and 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 so inviting people here um, into a movement um, led by by uh, the those that are most impacted because indeed uh, the, these bones uh, are leading um, and we heard this tonight and we're seeing this across the country and so um, so much appreciation for the 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 organizing and the and the vision that that people have and and for for all the panelists. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Lou to share a, a closing song with us next, and then we'll be wrapping up. Mm, thank you all so much. Thank you for those powerful words. Uh, Don, I knew when I heard 
uh, Ms. Maureen say, sign off saying, I'm not afraid. I, I knew what song we ha I had to close this out with tonight. Um, so we're gonna sing together. Uh, we are not afraid, we are not afraid. We will live for liberation because we know why we were made. And, uh, and I wanna appreciate Raj for bringing in our comrades in Colombia. So I have some people who have been in the streets risking their lives for justice uh, in, in Colombia for the people. And so all of our people who are on these front lines out here, protecting the land, the water, and the people, looking out for each other, um, love and respect. Uh, I'm about to go join the rest of my hood at our weekly food distribution after we sing this song. And I just want to give so much love and gratitude again for to Miss Maureen saying, uh, that's who I am. I'm not afraid. Um, so uh, I'm Luai of the Peace Poets. I am also uh, not afraid because I know why we were made. Grateful to sing this song with you. We are not afraid. That's right. We are not afraid. We will live for liberation because we know why we were made. Come on. We are not afraid. Sing it. We are not afraid. We will live for liberation. We know why we were made. Let me hear y'all. We are not afraid. Come on. We are not afraid. We will live for liberation. Cause we know why we were made. My fearlessness is but a bread. Will you be with me, beloved? Be loved by me, who's only you, unbeautiful and uncovered. Cause here within the darkness, I pick the lock with kindness. And I have heard my brother's laugh heal this country's blindness. And I decided to stop wanting more. All I want is eyes, so I'm staring into yours. We just decided to stop wanting more. All we want is life, so we're here to fight for yours. Singing, we are not afraid. That's right. We are not afraid. We will live for liberation. Cause we know why we were made. Sing it out. We are not afraid. No, no, no. We are not afraid. We will live for liberation. Cause we know why we were made. That's right. And my fearlessness is butter bread. Just butter bread. Can we get some bread for our people out here? My fearlessness is elders teaching us the way to walk. That's right. And my fearlessness is in the people in my hood. My fearlessness lives in the inspiration of every single mother, father, grandma raising our little ones right now. That's what's happening. How am I going to be afraid? You know what I'm talking about? I know you do. I'm not afraid, I'm alive, my heart is pumping If you not messing with this vibe, let me tell you something You got lungs full of sky, take a breath What you really want to say before the sun set I'm on fire, my people got me inspired The second I'm getting tired, I hear them whispering, not yet I'm like, bet, a right wing death threat Shoot me in the chest, I'll still be singing at the protest Cause I am not afraid, we are not no, we are not afraid, we will live for liberation Cause we know why we were made, I need y'all to sing We are not afraid, fill that room up We are not afraid, we will live for liberation Cause we know why we were made, so your neighbors hear it We are not afraid, they not either No, we are not afraid we will live for liberation Cause we know why we were made Thank you so much. Love and respect. Thanks so, thank so much, Lou. So really a beautiful way to close us out this evening. I want to thank everyone for joining us and for joining the very first Survival Summit uh, tonight focused on food justice. Um, we're looking forward to a series of these conversations, so keep your eyes peeled as those are announced. Um, I'd like to give my heartfelt thank you and gratitude to our panelists who joined uh, us tonight and shared their uh, words and experiences with us. Um, and thank 
you to those of you at home who shared your questions and your interest and your attention. Um, and thank you all for the work that you do every day. Those of you who are joining us are also out there uh, day in and day out um, making uh, this this world a better place. And we appreciate you for that. Um, we invite you to uh, uh, continue along with the, the conversation. Uh, we'll be looking at the questions in the chat and sharing some responses um, going forward. We also wanna thank uh, Free Speech uh, TV who has helped to bring this uh, broadcast to you tonight. Uh, we hope this has been an enlightening conversation. I know I've learned a lot and I definitely sparked a lot of interest to continue to, to dig in um, as we go forward. Uh, we hope to uh, share information to you soon. And of course, this event has been brought to you by uh, the Cairo Center. And as the former development person at the Cairo Center, I would be remiss to uh, not mention um, to continue to support uh, the great work um, that the Cairo Center does building leaders across the country in this movement. And you can always make a contribution at cairocenter.org backslash donate. Um, and, uh, Thank you so much. Until next time, uh, keep following along at, at Cairo Center on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and I encourage all of you listening at home to, if you're not connected, to find these organizations or out there in your community across the country, um, connected to the Poor People's Campaign out there doing this work around hunger and changing the world. And I hope you'll join us. Uh, thank you so much and have a great night.